Hey. Are, are we live? I think oh, we are. We are. People we are can live. Hear us now. Yes. Oh, okay. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London calling Rick Byer in Chicago. It, the connection is good, Chris. It is. Yeah. Is How surprising. are you? Yeah. I, I'm well. I, as I mentioned earlier, it's hotter than Hades here. And um, it is hotter here than it is in Ibiza, apparently, which is good where, because. Where I is think Ibiza? In Spain. Okay. And since I can't go to Spain anymore, I can have it right here in my living room. So. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Awesome job. And how is it, Chicago? Uh, Chicago is great. It's nice here. It's real busy. Everybody's excited to be outside and enjoying the uh, the weather. I want to welcome everybody to History Happy Hour and uh, brought to you with the support and assistance of who, Chris? Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Absolutely. And we're waiting a minute for people to join us so that we can get started for real. And Joy, please post something to let us know who who's here. And Chris, who's who's some of people who's, who's here? I well, can't so even speak today. Yeah, go ahead. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, Dor Doreen, of course, and Marcus. So uh, that's great. Frank, uh, John from Toronto. So uh, Jean from Pennsylvania. Nancy, yeah. Nancy, and all who's sorts also of hot and sticky in Texas. Which I guess Sandra right. and Al Shine, and and lots of other people joining us as we go. Lizzie Borden from London. Right. Okay, Lizzie. Lizzie, <laughs> do you have an axe? Okay, or is it she a does. different Lizzie Borden? She or does. she might. She might. Right. I just want to remind people that if you like the show, and of course, maybe you don't know yet, because if you're here for the first time, you say, well, you haven't done anything yet. We don't know if we like the show. Uh, make sure you're following us on Facebook or subscribing on YouTube, whichever is the place that you're watching. And if you want to be on our newsletter list, you can email us at info at historyhappyhour.net. Uh, we've only sent out one newsletter so far, Chris. So yes. um, what is summertime? Yeah, people people may like say I gave you our my email and I'm not getting a newsletter from you. Well, we'll do one this week. So if you don't get one this week, then Promise. you can yeah Promise. change things. And Chris, did you know that we now have our own Twitter feed? No, I did, but you did know. That was sound surprised. Yeah, no. yeah, that was good. Okay, <laughs> and uh, our Twitter feed is history happy. It's history hap hour. History Hap Hour. I put it. I put it up in the comments section. History Hap Hour for those people who are really desperate to get more from us, um, um, and that that probably is pretty desperate. So, are are we are we ready think, to roll I think here? We're ready. Yeah, I think we're right. ready for some intelligent conversation. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Give us the drum roll. <laughs> Is open. The bar is open. Did it sound to you like the open there was running a little fast at the beginning? I thought it was like yeah. it was zooming along. I'm not sure what that was about. Even the open is tired of listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> we talk, Chris, a lot about war on this yes. program. Yes, we do. In different wars, World War II, World War I, the Revolutionary War. Uh, and today we're going to talk about a different kind of war, a railroad war. And this railroad war takes place after the Civil War in the American West, kind of starting in Colorado and then sprawling all over half dozen other states and even into Mexico. And it involves two railroads led by two powerful men and they're kind of locked in corporate combat. And I think having read this uh, book that we're gonna talk about today, war is not too strong a word no, to use actually. for what goes on with these two guys. Um, and it's, uh, it's a story filled with fascinating characters and uh, kind of insights into what a brawling free-for-all railroading was in the American West. And our guest today is uh, John Sedgwick. He is a best-selling author. He has, I think, 13 books to his credit, if I've counted correctly. He's written extensively for The Atlantic, uh, GQ, Newsweek, Esquire, Vanity Fair. And his new book is entitled from the river to the sea the untold story of the railroad war that made the west and so we want to welcome to our show uh john sedgwick john i'm trying to bring you up and there hey, you are okay hey. john was wondering he said are they ever going to get to me <laughs> <laughs> i have no doubt and besides i was happy just listening to you guys you're fine oh <laughs> Thank you. you're winning our hearts and i want to well. just say I just want to start. say, as, <laughs> as I as I pour my beer here, Chris, uh -huh. I just want to say 
that John comes to us on a recommendation from my friend Paul Singer, whose father was in what World War II oh, unit, do you go. imagine? Yes. Easy Company. The, the Ghost Army. Oh, okay. oh sorry. Uh, okay. But, um, John, um, all right, we're going to get to it. Uh, your story picks up where another famous story in American history leaves off. And in 18... Uh, of uh, uh, 67, 69, 69 uh, mm -hmm. four years after the end of the American Civil War, the Central Pacific Railroad heading east from California and the Union Pacific Railroad heading west from Nebraska meet here at Promontory Summit in Utah Territory. It's the first transcontinental railroad. The Golden Spike is driven in and then later stolen. And uh, your story is kind of about what happens next and the people who make it happen or at least part of what happens next. So introduce us to this tale and why you decided to write about it. Well, let me just say first before you, um, that, that picture is wonderful because if you can put it back up, you will see that there's a, it's the kind of a whiskey salute there, right? You see a bottle of booze on one side and a glass on the other, I think, which is kind of the universal greeting and one that's very much appropriate <laughs> to your show. But when this, when this um, photo went out, the booze was edited. What you're seeing is the original. What the rest of America saw was the sanitized, abstemious version, which would, is not right for your show. So I just want to tell you that. And then the other thing that's funny about it is that that um, that was selling. You know, that was the big moment in American railroading. It's when, just as you said, the, the um, one line coming uh, um, west hits the other line coming east, and then there is this famous um, uh, uh, driving home of. The, um, of the Golden Spike by somebody named Leland Sanford, who was, you know, of Stanford University um, later, but he was also had been a candidate for governor in, Cal uh, in California. But the thing that I always enjoy about the fact is that he was wielding this enormous uh, um, hammer. And it was really too much for him. And then he, when he brought the thing down on what he thought was the spike, he missed. And this was a calamity because that was supposed to trigger the telegraphic it was, signal. It was wired up, right? It was wired up so that when that switch was completed, the word would go out that it was done. That was the one word that went out across, the, not as across the United States, but around the world. Well, he missed. So the, <laughs> the poor telegrapher had to the key in that um, by hand. And to me, that that was reflective of something larger that was going on there, which was, this was, you know, it's to say it was a goof is, is, is completely unfair, but it wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. The, the, everybody remembers this first transcontinental as being, the, you know, pivotal in uh, um, America's completing itself from coast to coast. But it was really much more the, um, like the Apollo program the, um, of, um, you know, of our era, where it was a government-sponsored effort to, as really a demonstration project to show that this could be done. But it wasn't done on a particularly commercial basis. And as a result, that, that it did not generate the traffic that was needed for it to be sustained as a commercial enterprise. And one of the reasons for that was that they weren't very careful about putting in the in deciding where the, tra the towns would go along the tracks. And instead, they had these famous hell on wheels towns that would flourish just for a brief time with a lot of booze and card playing and, and painted ladies. And then it would go and then the, the tracks would be extended further into the west. Uh, um, and that that line would no longer that town would no longer be the terminus. And it would basically disappear. And uh, so that the, and that was true quite um, across the West, and so that even though it's far more celebrated than the, the achievement of the two railroad men that I'm about to describe to you, that it was, in, it was considerably less successful, and in fact, in the long run, much less meaningful. But it's the only thing that people remember nowadays about the transcontinental. Okay, but now you have to actually answer the question that I asked. Oh my God, uh, I hate that. Uh, um, all right. I was, uh, um, 
we'll hold your okay, feet well, to the fire. The answer to the question that you asked is, uh, I think the question was, why did I write this book? Right, tell us, kind of give us an overview of the story and why you, you wrote yeah. that. Well, the, the reason I wrote the book was that I was astonished to learn about this railroad war that I had never heard of, that, that occurred in um, 18, it started in 1878 and, and involved uh, um, uh, two railroad lines that ostensibly were there just to build railroads. And so obviously there was railroad workers of the conventional sort. But once the uh, this conflict um, became more manifest, and once they the two sides got into it, it developed from a, a mere business conflict into an out and out war, and that the the individual the, um, tr these uh, the workers along the line were then given rifles and turned into soldiers aiming guns at the other side. Um, and that they and that this whole thing was going to be resolved by force, not by anything else. Now, this is unique in American history. That, that if you think about it, that you know, when Bill Gates has a dispute with Steve Jobs, that they don't you know enlist uh, soldiers to start shooting at each other. The only time that that don't give them the were, idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gates is in the no position, and neither neither is Jobs, obviously. But uh, um, but that the um, but it, this it, but usually you know in any kind of dispute like this, if there's um, violence, it's in a strike breaking context. It's not uh, in the context of one company doing battle with another. Okay, so I thought that was amazing, that, that, that this railroad dispute should grow into a, an actual war. And then what was astonishing was what came from that war, that these two lines, once they resolved their issue in Colorado, and I can talk more about exactly how that came to be, but it proved to be immensely consequential because this dispute was the thing that was going to decide how the West was going to be created. Was it going to be created by one line that was bent on going north-south, or was it going to be created by another line that was bent on going east-west? And then which, and then those routes, whichever route survived, was going to be the route by which America's American West was going to follow. That it was going to be the consequential route, and ultimately, of course, it, one of them led to this. What was then this sleepy. The, um, Spanish Pueblo called Los Angeles uh, um, that was a nothing place until the railroad arrived. And that's just one example. There's Albuquerque. Uh, it's, uh, Santa Fe was built up from almost nothing. Uh, um, El Paso. I mean, you can see them if you if you can make it out on your screen. But the, this route that you're describing is the route, really, uh, of uh, any of at least you know, 15, 20 American cities that would not have been built up and would not have been located there but for this uh, railroad so it was immensely consequential uh, and and then on top of that of course it it wasn't just which towns would be created it would be what those towns would look like what would they be related to uh, um, and so that you know when a railroad comes through and it creates a railroad town a railroad town is a very distinctive place and it's a place that has regular features that are reproduced everywhere it goes and we're very familiar with these although we don't realize that there was the railroads that, that created them for one thing it, it's all in the grid pattern now, um, these are streets that are uh, that run 90 degrees apart from avenues and that, and that at the center of them is the railroad building uh, um, and usually the the major street going through town is called railroad Ave or at least was initially, and then the street that, that, that intersected it was called Main Street. And, and that you could tell, and that because the train was at the center, it was in fact the dominant force. It, it was the source of all life on the prairie. All the goods, all the passengers, all the news, all the cables, all came in to the railroad center. The, it was the center of life. And interestingly, that it was oftentimes the architectural style of that railroad station was the dominant architectural style 
of the town. And it also dictated this thing, you know, the wrong side of the tracks. Well, that's not metaphorical. There was that they would put the banks on one side and the saloons on the other. And, and that it would divide the, and you know where we would be. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, let's be clear. But, uh, but so there was the moneyed side and there was the not moneyed side. And then they would also determine that they would lay out these plats, as they were called, the plan for, this, for the town. And they would, they would set where the parks would be and exactly the size of the house lots and then therefore the sizes of the houses there were in the house lot and that this was they were basically the the only government because they were the only place with capital and authority remember this this my story starts in 1878 well it was in 1874 the colorado became a state so that it was still very much fledgling and other states around it like new mexico didn't become a state until the 20th century like 1906 i think uh, um, they were still territories which meant that they were unformed and that they were open to basically the, whoever had uh, brought came in with the most power and the power was defined by how much money they had and the railroads had the money. So, so John, one of the things when, you know, when Rick first told me about the book, um, he said, hey, you know, it's great. We have this great book about railroads. Um, and I said, okay, that, that could be interesting. But then when I started to read the book, the book is really about people. And, yes. and what really strikes me are the personalities yes. involved in the story. So could you describe, you know, um, kind of some of the notable ones or, or your two main, pe sure. main characters and then kind of what personalities well, pop out of you and how. Yeah, of course. I mean, th this was the other thing that was so striking to me. I mean, just on the railroad side, it was fascinating that one of these lines was bent on going, they were both bent on getting to the Pacific. That's what would make them transcontinental. But the, one of them was bent on going north-south, starting in Denver, and going straight down to Mexico and hitting the Pacific at the coast of the Baja of California, on the Bay of California, on the so that it would it would hit Pacific in Mexico. Imagine that. The other one was bent on going the, um, west from Kansas on the line that, as I say, the, the bullet might take. It would go straight to California and hit the sea there. That, well, that, that's obviously a contrast. But the, the contrast that you're alluding to is, is just as profound, and I found it fascinating, between the two guys behind these two lines. One of them, the, the north-south line, was called the Denver and Rio Grande, and it was led by a dashing Civil War general named William J. Palmer, who styled himself, and you can see there, as the, the best-dressed man in, Cal in uh, Colorado. I mean, you can see the, the well-turned collar, uh, you see the, the, um, the vest, you see the, the um, there's some chains going, going over there, it's really hard to see at this distance. But, but clearly, this is the man who's very comfortable being photographed. He's actually a five foot eight, but he seems somewhat imperious all the same. In those days, uh, um, that a man was really defined by his whiskers. This is you know this from Civil War generals, which every one of them has a different set of uh, whiskers. But this guy, you know, obviously just has the the mustache was a little bit more elegant. He was You're winning the whisker war today. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to catch up. Uh, um, they, okay, so that that's that's him. And amazingly, in the in the Civil War that his job, he decided that what he was going to do was to be a spy behind enemy lines. When McClellan didn't know which way Lee was going to go after Antietam, that he volunteered to find out, and and that that was an incredibly risky thing to do. And sure enough, he was captured because one of his mindless companions gave him away by saying, it, when he was caught, he said, where did he come from? He said, from that house. And then, of course, Palmer was in there, and so he got grabbed too. And then he was sent, actually, uh, um, to Lee himself to decide what was to become of him. And Lee said, hang him. I mean, like, obvious, at the soonest opportunity. And as, it, but it was very late at night. He was taken down to Richmond to be hanged. And the guy, the, the, the sergeant in charge of the fort where he was to be hanged, was just too tired to go through the correspondence. Oh, and yeah. said, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just put you um, in this hellhole uh, um, prison instead. And, and so you can do that. So that, but imagine, he was on this eight-hour uh, um, horse ride down to Richmond thinking that he was going to be hanged once he arrived. 
Can you? I mean, I just find that an unimaginable scenario. Anyway, but he managed to catch his freedom, gets out, and then uh, is, uh, distinguishes himself at uh, distinguishes himself at Chickamauga in the in the in Tennessee, uh, be, rises to become a brigadier general, and then when the war is over, is selected to chase down Jefferson Davis, who is a fugitive from justice, and it, it was marauding somewhere around South Carolina and Georgia, and but Palmer was the one to find his uh, wagon of uh, um, gold and banknotes that he was relying on, and he, when he captured that, uh, um, the that, uh, that um, Jefferson Davis was captured shortly thereafter. So, it, it, but then he turned to the railroads um, because that's what any enterprising young man would do. That was the only game in town if you wanted to get rich and powerful. And started this line uh, um, coming down, as I say, from Denver, uh, um, due south. And it, it, he gets as far as this little town called Pueblo, south of, of Colorado Springs, when this other line comes in from Kansas, headed west. And that is uh, headed up by a man with even more spectacular whiskers, uh, um, <laughs> William Barstow Strong. And to me, that's the most amazing beard ever. It's like a beard that got away from him. Uh, um, his, his whiskers, to me, look like an inverted flame. I, I don't know. And I'm surely when he talked, they shook a little. Uh, um, it, this is oh. heavy on the whiskers. Um, so, I, I, but he was a career railroad man uh, um, from the, um, Beloit, Wisconsin, and, and that he had uh, worked in the railroad starting at age 15. And then uh, managed to work his way up to the the, um, the Burlington, uh, uh, Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, which was a, another uh, uh, railroad in the making in the in the Midwest, where he was picked up by the Santa Fe uh, um, to be their general manager and ultimately their president. And he, even though he seems rather mild in that, that picture, he was a man of extraordinary determination. Um, but he, he was operating by one principle, which was grow or die. His answer to any railroad question was to lay down more track and then lay down more track still. This was a hugely ambitious guy who was determined to get somewhere. So that was his intention. And also the Santa Fe Railroad, curiously enough, was not based in Santa Fe, as you might think, or even in Kansas where it started. It was headquartered in Boston, my own hometown, uh, on Devonshire Street, um, way back east. And you wonder, well, why out there? And the, the answer is that Boston was a very early railroad hub. It was uh, the place where it had initially more tracks going in and around Boston than any other part of the country. And so that um, so that later, even though the railroad spread, that, that the financial interests remained. So that the, the they. Uh, um, so it was good Boston man. I it's also where the money, the well, money was. It, yeah, well, the money was there uh, for two reasons. For, uh, first, it was the China trade that you know at the beginning of the 19th century, and then it was textiles. Uh, um, uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, for example, was a great textile. Sure. And that, and that there was uh, these huge uh, um, fortunes, and then the Boston crowd was organized so that it, there was a very socially inbred group. So uh, so that the families would intermarry and then enhance their fortunes that way. I'm sure you guys. You well, know, Chris have, and I are both actually money, um, money behind you. Am I right? Yeah, we, yeah, right yeah. Uh, we are both I people. Did, yes. Chris <laughs> is a native Bostonian, and I am a uh, uh, spent right? many many years. Yeah. I'm a New Englander who spent many years in Boston, and we are both fabulously wealthy beyond your imagination. <laughs> we just dabble. We dabble. We we are trying desperately to hide it, so please don't tell anyone. <laughs> well, you just you just blew it. You just told uh, me well, I it. actually I actually lived in Brookline, which is where yeah. uh, William Barstow Storm, Strong, yeah. when he becomes yeah. president of the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. Uh, yeah. moves to Brookline, which you wouldn't think, okay, the president of the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe is living in Brookline, Mass., right. which is, of course, where yeah. John Kennedy is born some years right. later. How but, does, you, had a, you made that, why did you bring Kennedy? <laughs> I, because I could. I, I lived on the street next to Beale okay, Street okay, where yeah, Kennedy yeah. was born. So well, He's probably he's, the most famous uh, um, Brookliner. Uh, Brookliner ever. Uh, um, yeah, except I for think Barbara Mike Wallace, Wallace was from Brookline, too. Barbara sure. Walters also, okay. also uh, was from Brookline. Great town. Brookline is an interesting place because Brookline, <laughs> as I noted in the book, is, is carved out of Boston. If you look right. at the map, there's a little chunk that should be Boston, but instead it's Brookline. 
Brookline because rich people in Brookline didn't want to be part of Boston. Yeah, we were. We had to remove themselves, uh, um, and that's why you guys. But uh, you know, so I think it's interesting. You you alluded to this, but um, uh, uh, it, it did strike me. Uh, before I get into my next question, that the names of both these railroads are very aspirational. That the Absolutely. Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe, when it's named that, is a railroad in Kansas. There's no New Mexico that's part of it. It's just Santa Fe is like, oh, maybe, maybe. And then the that's Denver right. and Rio Grande, you know, at that point, the railroad runs from Denver to Pueblo. You know, it's uh, hundreds of miles from the Rio Grande. So it, these right. are... These are great names that are entirely marketing fantasy, you know, bring in the investor kind of names. Absolutely. And that's why Pacific was a common word that was used in these uh, transcontinental, the Kansas Pacific, the Union Pacific, uh, um, the Northern Pacific. Uh, they were all letting investors know, just as you say, where they were going to get, whether they got there or not it was an open question, but that was where they intended to get. And you're absolutely right about the, the Santa Fe, um, that that yeah, it was a very humble line, and that Atchison and Topeka are maybe 60 miles apart, uh, um, and that this was, was all they intended to do initially was, if they got across Kansas, they thought they would they would do well, but then a, an early owner of, um, of, the, uh, of the railroad was just absolutely determined to get to, uh, um, to the Pacific, uh, um, and it just couldn't, uh, um, and, and then named it Santa Fe because it played into this notion uh, of these trails. There were two trails that west there was the independence trail the west that pioneers took there's also the santa fe trail and the so that santa fe the, to uh, anybody in kansas was exactly aspirational it, it meant that this was the route west and if the santa fe railroad would call it identify itself with santa fe that was something that, that people could latch on to uh, we're talking to John Sedgwick, who's the author of uh, From the River to the Sea. And, and John, one of the things I was interested in was the madcap free-for-all aspect of this. I mean, so when, when, when let's bring in General Eisenhower. When Eisenhower, of sainted memory, we'll all stand yeah. up straight. <laughs> it, we, we have the highways. We're going to make a plan. Here's where they're going to go. It's going to be already organized. Okay, there is no master plan for this. It is like this railroad's going to go over here, and this railroad's going to go over here, and and hey, where should we go? Hey, well, will your town pay us some money? Maybe we'll lay down some track there, or should Absolutely. the tracks go over here? Or maybe we'll pretend to build over here when we really want to build over here. So it's kind of this crazy, um, uh, as I say, free for all, isn't it? It was not just that. I mean, that, that's absolutely right. That's a good description. But it also involved espionage uh, um, because the 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 clearest um, indication that a destination was worth worth getting to was that if your rival wanted it and it, so that the every railroad man hid his destination from others and every railroad man was trying to divine the intentions of which his would rival. seem hard to do when you're pointing tracks down right <laughs> well, I'm laying no, tracks because... but I don't want to tell you where they're going to go. Yeah, well, the thing was that, yes, you could you could uh, um, start with your track and lay down track and then point the direction you're going to go to, or you could jump to the destination, lay down track, and, and then claim it. Uh, uh, and especially if this was a place where there was room only for one set of tracks, once you had that nailed down, then you could build to it at your leisure. And, and the thing that was so frightening for these railroad men was that they never knew when one shining morning that the place that they had meant to build through was taken uh, um, suddenly unexpectedly horrifyingly taken and that this you know may have been the the product of some plan that was years in the making and then overnight boom is gone well that's a scary proposition for these guys and um, and they lived in that fear and that they kept trying to as I say, they would intercept cables, they would shadow the opposition, they would keep track of where workers were going, uh, all these uh, um, things that, you know, would happen in a genuine, in a regular war with espionage, uh, um, happened in these railroad wars for the same reason. You wanted to know your enemy's plans before he could act on them so that you could take them for yourself. So, uh, John, we, we have a, I got a traffic at this right here, the question, um, 
from James. He said, why did these two railroads end up at war with each other? Kind of playing off what Rick just asked, the West seems like a really big place. <laughs> right. You know? No, it, well, that, that's the fascinating question. And it has to do with where do you go in a wide open place? I mean, there, there was a standard text of the time. It was written by an engineer named Wellington. And what he said was basically, you, you want to go from a high population area to another place that is at least potentially of high population. So that you needed two fixed points that, that would establish traffic between them. In the West, those fixed points didn't exist. Uh, um, the Denver was the city that came closest, but it was, it was a city of only 5,000 people, and that really wasn't a good basis for building a railroad line. Well, okay, but then there are other things you might think about. You might want to go to a mine, uh, or you might want to go to some cropland, or you might want to go uh, um, to, I don't know, the shore of some river uh, that seems promising. Well. Yes, except that it all depended on how expensive it was to build there. And if you had to go in a loop around some mountains to get there, that was going to drive up costs. Were the costs going to be covered by the destination if the destination had not yet come into anything? That was hard. It was a murderous kind of calculation to make. So both men said, screw Wellington. We're going to do it on an entirely different basis. And that basis was that if we were going to, it was two things. One was that in the part of Palmer who got there, or got there first, what he did was he spotted a town that might need a train and then said, how much will you pay me to build a train there? So it was an entirely, it's a, and then he would go, That's to, awesome, another, right? and then he would go to another town and ask them how much they would pay. And then he would compare the price. Then if one town said 50,000 and another town said 100,000, guess which one he would go to. And then he would go to the one that was to 100, for 100,000. And then those property um, would increase in value uh, you know tremendously i mean these towns mind you were usually they would, on a good day they would have three visitors coming by horseback that once the train came in a hundred would come in at a time and there might be two or three trains i mean there's it was a, just there, there's another part of this that's interesting which is which is i mean just to give you an idea of kind of the cutthroat greed you know to, to hell with everything attitude which is like, yeah, you, so your town puts up the $50,000 and we'll build the railroad there, but we'll stop it two miles short of the town center or we'll stop it across the river. Well, you're going to have to move the town here where, by the way, we have bought all the property. <laughs> Exactly. It was utterly ruthless. And in fact, those those things were more identified with Palmer. See, the, the other thing about these two railroads that was such a contrast was that Palmer's was really a mom and pop operation. It really just popped. That was him. It was a basically a sole proprietorship of him and his friends. And that it was intended to be small and stay small. He wanted it to be a kind of family run enterprise where everybody was friends. And as a, a representation of that, that they used what was called the narrow gauge line. So the, this was, there are different gauges or widths of track and that, and that his was the narrowest. It was just three feet across, which meant that his was going to have small railroads, fewer cars, but that he thought that that would be the best way for to negotiate around the mountains where you had to make a lot of twists and turns. Well, Strong, on the other hand, with the Santa Fe Railroad, that that was intended to be a full-fledged corporation, which is why he, as the general manager, was the manager of it. He didn't own it. He was running it. Uh, that there were investors who owned it. He was not an investor. That, and so that he was hired initially by the railroad to run this thing to um, out west however he could do it. And that... He, and so that with this investment of the Boston crowd behind it, he was very well funded. And so that he could then have the standard gauge tracks that were four feet, eight and a half inches wide, that, that would have these big locomotives, lots of train uh, of passenger of cars behind and get by on volume that he could go blasting through and then increase his the number of miles of track that would in turn generate more revenue so that he could just keep going and going and going whereas palmer by trying to stay small was constantly 
in this effort to generate the cash that he needed now to keep going so that he, he didn't he wasn't able to execute the master plan of getting to the pacific he kept having to stop and then dip into the mountains for cash it, but hope for a mine here or hope that a little town there would give him money to keep going whereas strong was able to keep going regardless of that he didn't have to keep diverting he could just keep charging ahead well, so these two lines, you know, came into conflict uh, um, just south of, of Denver in this little town called Pueblo, which is, it happened just the way you were describing, where the, when Palmer came down to Pueblo to, to put the first line in, he didn't stop at Pueblo. He created this new town of his own called South Pueblo that was five miles past. The people in Pueblo, it, it was almost funny that he comes in with the first train and they and he goes blowing right by and they go wait 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 you're supposed to stop here stop <laughs> and he's like cruising on five miles more the south pueblo and they're saying south pueblo pueblo he says no sorry south pueblo where he know has owns all the land and is as building up houses that he that have been paid you know that by homeowners who had paid him for the land he had obviously the, not read uh, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Well, it comes back to haunt him later, but it was what he kind of had to do. So, and by contrast, when uh, um, Strong brings his line into Pueblo, he comes to Pueblo itself. And as, they, as the local paper said, it set off the biggest drunk in the history of, the, uh, <laughs> of Colorado. The people were so overjoyed. Up until that, that time. Pueblo, up <laughs> until later. Just to be clear. <laughs> Just to be clear. We're going to set the record tonight. No, um, but yeah, so that, so that was the way these two different men operated. Okay, so once they get to Pueblo, that's when the fun begins because they, then they tr are trying to decide where to go next. And here is where the the, the railroad war that I'm describing kicks in because they're trying to decide from there where to go. And that, that initially, as I say, that one was going to go due south, the other was going to go due west. And that, interestingly, once they come into each other's orbit, each one decide, sort of leans towards the other that, and thinks, well, maybe they know better than I do. Maybe I shouldn't trust my initial I instinct. I should go by what that guy's going to do because probably he knows better. And so that it's neither then stays to the original uh, um, uh, ambition that they both start creeping into the south. Now they, go, they don't go south. They don't go west. They go southwest. They, and they go southwest over the only route into the southwest that's available to a train at the southern end of the Rockies through the Rattan Pass. The Rattan Pass is just a dip in the mountains, but it's enough to lower the elevation enough that a train by it can do enough crisscrosses uh, um, that it can get up and over. It's the only place where that's possible. Uh, um, and the question was, who was going to get there first? So um, can I bring in a couple of uh, audience questions, Chris? Yeah, please. Yeah. 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 So um, here's one um, from High Noon 1952. I'm not sure who that is, but OK. But who asks about uh, property rights for all this ah. track? And what is the what? Is, I have to say, even having read the book, it, this was a little confusing to me about oh, that. Oh, it's incredibly confusing because, well, first of all, property rights was a notion that the white men brought in to an area where there had been no property rights because Native Americans they are, um, they didn't believe in property. They didn't. That was a capitalist notion that they had no concept of. It was like to own the land was as ridiculous as owning sunlight or air. You know, it was just inconceivable. So one of the things that made it so hard on the, on the Indians who were there was that they just didn't understand the basis that all this was happening. And, and okay, so the, the railroads come in and the federal government decides that a there is this thing called property that can be bought and sold and owned and that and by the way it's ours now um so that the federal government was able to to claim any land that couldn't be spoken for by any other um, claim and so that it, it left this hodgepodge in the West where some, some of the land could be traced back to the original Mexican 
owners that had been, you know, because Mexico, m much of this land was originally Mexican until the Mexican-American War of, of 1848 that removed Mexico back to the Rio Grande River to, to the, the the property line that it now holds. Until that time, until 1848, all of, the, of that Southwest was part of Mexico. That, um, so that it had its own uh, um, title and its own transfers. And if you could uh, somehow uh, um, link back to at to that, then maybe you had claim to that to that land. And indeed, it, the part of the Rattan Pass was owned was was part of what was called the Maxwell Grant that came from an original Mexican governor, and it was enormous. It was the size. It was twice the size of Rhode Island, and it included whole mountain ranges. It was so big. And so, the, so, and that was land that possibly that could be owned, and then had to be bought by the railroad that was going to run through it, or at least title, a clearance had to be given to the railroad by anybody who did own it. Now, um, but then there's the other areas where that was not the case, and and, and for those, the railroads, the the the, the, the uh, railroads had either get them for free. Uh, um, and just lay claim to them, or they were given to them by the federal government. But by the time that these two railroads that I'm talking about that were coming in, the railroad, the, the federal government had gotten out of the land grant business. So these li the, all of the, the territory that I'm talking about had to be bought and acquired and titled by the railroads. And often they could get it for free because nobody had a legitimate claim. Or if they did have a claim, that the real it was very cheap in price because it was relatively it was without value without a train. Once the train got there, it was enormously valuable. But before that, it was dirt cheap, and that was the way that the railroads made their money. They were in the real estate business. Yeah, they were not in the transportation business. They were in the business of buying low and selling high. That's where the money came from. They were in the business of building towns and developing property. So, John, one of the things, I mean, there, there are lots of these little kind of nuggets that you describe in the book that have such huge implications for, for us, for America. Um, and one of the things that really struck me uh, with Palmer is he had a vision of the West that I really hadn't pictured. You know, he, he almost wanted to create... A, a, I kept thinking like it was going to be a country club or a gated community. That's right. Um, That's which exactly is not right. Something that I picture when I think of these railroad tycoons in the West. So, are there conflicting visions of the West, and are, are these men creating it? Or well, that that's it. That, that not only did they uh, were they the ones to decide where the towns would be, but as I alluded to before, they were the ones to decide what those towns were going to look like, and they had absolutely contrasting visions of this. And there is no better example of what Palmer was after than Colorado Springs. And there is no better example of, uh, of what he was really about as a person than the explanation for why he wanted Colorado Springs to look the way it did. And the, the answer there was the he had aristocratic pretensions. You can see that in, in the picture. This is a man who was seen, born to be in some sort of social club. I mean, he was a good-looking guy who lorded it over other people. Um, but he, had, um, he was a deep romantic. And his view of the West was that it was it was going to be like the Alps. It was going to be like Val d'Isere or, or any of these Alpine resort, resorts. See, that was the thing that was so fascinating about the West is that nobody knew what was there or what it could look like. And so they kept trying to import notions from other places that people liked. So they wanted to make it the Alps in one case here in, in Colorado Springs. Later in Los Angeles, they wanted to make it Italy. They kept calling it our Italy. And the reason that they did that was that there was no other way to think about it except in comparison to places that they did know. And they could say it's going to be just like that. that um, but in fact, it was nothing. And it all had to be created. Uh-oh. I've lost your voice. No, no, it's Rick is. No, I've muted myself. He mutes himself. Well, I we do. Generally I haven't appreciate done it in that. A while. So, but yeah, well, I mute yeah. Chris too, but I usually <laughs> unmute him before he starts talking. I was going to say, Los Angeles is just like Rome and Italy. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, it really is pretty much hard, hard to tell. 
that yeah. you're in Los Angeles. Well, it, but in terms of, of its climate, I mean, it, that's the thing is that it was sold as one that, that could be like, you know, Rome, Naples, any of that. Uh, um, but of course, it was all about the prospect of its becoming that and that they kept they wanted easterners to be able to visualize a lovely climate and so and a sort of sophisticated feeling and that when they were once they were there and got there they could then build it up and it could become that which it did in you know a place like pasadena became really quite elegant uh, um, and many San Bernardino, Riverside, uh, all of those places uh, um, were really quite uh, luxurious uh, in the early days uh, um, because once the money from the eats started pouring in, they really did live on this fantasy that, that it could become something that would rival the, the European cities of yore. But anyway, to get back to, to Palmer, the, when he was creating Colorado City, uh, Colorado Springs, that he wanted it to have uh, to be sort of like the Alps. It was a place of enormous uh, um, beauty. It was right in the uh, in the shadow uh, um, of Pikes Peak, the one of the tallest uh, uh, mountains and certainly the most impressive mountains in that part of the Rockies, over fourteen thousand feet. He found that to be just a glorious vista, and he wanted to sort of capture that and make it. He had a sort of resort mentality that his idea for the West was it was a place to go and be elevated by the natural beauty of the place and that the people who came were people themselves of elevation and that it would be a beautiful social club where they could enjoy nature, it would be healthy and that they could be surrounded by people just like them and it would all be just fantastic. And one reason that he wanted to build that town in that way was that he had fallen desperately in love with the woman that I believe you have a picture of, Queen Mellon. In this picture, I think she's about 18, and it's that's how she looked when he first met her. That He was 35, so almost twice her age, and they were traveling in a he was on a train going through Ohio, talking to her father, who was possibly a um, going to be an investor in his railroad. And then she came into the compartment, sat down behind Dad, and it, uh, Palmer took one look at her, and his life just completely was overturned. He had never seen anyone as rapturously beautiful as this woman. And without it, when the the um, when the trip was over. They exchanged torrid, increasingly torrid uh, um, uh, letters. Two weeks later, without having seen him again, they were engaged to be married. However, uh, um, she lived in Flushing, New York. He was set up in Colorado Springs. He needed to make Colorado Springs a place worthy of this woman, uh, um, Queen Mellon, who had a very musical voice. It was obviously a very seductive personality. And she was also a very cultured person who really liked her salons, liked her uh, um, orchestras, uh, um, liked her opera. And so that he needed Colorado Springs, which was out, it was just the most bleak outback in the shadow of this mountain. He had to turn that into a cultural hotspot, and he did. Uh, um, he made he brought in uh, um, you know, he made it a club, and in the club they would have all sorts of high society sorts of things. Uh, um, they would have the salons, they would have the libraries, they would have the the, um, the art galleries, uh, all of that. It's kind of a Green Acres story. <laughs> right because she ends up she likes new york and and even more she likes europe and he yeah. likes colorado springs and it's kind of a sad uh sad well, tale over end, time well in the end sadly i mean it, he just killed himself and he actually put up a castle for her not literally called, yeah yeah called glen airy uh, um it, the, the, where the, he the, um that would that would that he knew that she was inspired by the Ossian the, uh, fables of ancient Scotland and thought that this would really um, light up her fancy if he could create something like that for them 
And he did. So he did all of these things. And yet, sadly, it wasn't enough it, that she was still an Easterner by uh, um, disposition and that she there were too many rattlesnakes, for example, in Colorado Springs. And one of the first visits there that uh, that a, a cousin of her, hers is, is there and he boasts that he's that shot five of them just like in the last week or something. And she practically falls over that, um, that it, somebody that while she was there the first time there was a, an Indian prince who came around with four ponies hoping that he could buy her to be his wife in exchange for the ponies. And she's thinking, get me out of here. You should have offered some land for the railroad and then maybe there's a deal, right? Something I, like that. I, I, I want to, um, whose turn is it, Chris? I, I've, I've lost track. Okay. So uh, you, you could kind of subtitle your book, um, uh, fascinating characters from the West, because you do take some detours here and there to oh, introduce sure. us to some interesting people. And there's nobody in this book, uh, perhaps aside from the main characters, who is more interesting in my estimation than this man, Horace Austin Warner Tabor, known yeah. as Pa oh, yeah. Tabor, who might be one of the luckiest people in American history. <laughs> or in the world. There's nobody who, he had world-class luck. He really did. It was just astounding. As you can see, um, he's not a particularly prepossessing guy. Uh, he's got the, a hell of a mustache going, right? And some pretty good sideburns. But, you know, he was, he came to Leadville, the, um, the, which is the site of one of these railroad wars, the second one that was produced all the soldiers. He came to Leadville um, as just a, a humble prospector, hoping to make a fortune first in gold and then later in silver, and failed utterly. Uh, that wherever he put his uh, um, put in his uh, shovel yielded nothing. And he came with his wife Augusta, who, in great frustration, figures, "Screw this! I think we got to make a living here. I'm going to start a little grocery." And you know what, Hall? I think you should just be the clerk here and like forget about it. You're not going to be <laughs> amount to anything. Like just give it up. And he says, okay. Um, and then um, one day, a couple of um, prospectors like himself, one of them he describes the worst played out man he ever met. He came with, uh, all he had was a shovel and a dog and, and no money. And they <laughs> run up a, a $65 bill for groceries and they say, uh, we can't, um, we don't have any cash for this. How about you take it as a grub stake? A grub stake meaning uh, um, they're uh, sort of an investment in anything that they, uh, any so silver they turn up. Well, if Augusta, the wife, had heard that, she would have gone nuts and just thrown him out of the store. <laughs> but Haw was a gentleman and, and took kindly to these poor people and said, oh, okay. And sure, and then on top of it, gives them a bottle of booze, a whiskey, um, to just like seal the deal. And they go out into Leadville, and they just wander around, stumbling drunk, and then keel over and just and sleep it off. And then decide, well, this is as good a place to dig for silver as any place else. And they dig down twenty five feet, and they finally hit on something, which is the the lead carbonate. Uh, it's some that silver, you know, is unlike gold. It's not like it's just there down below and you see, ooh, a, gold, a nugget of silver. No, you don't. It's secreted inside this ore, and the ore has to be basically melted off before the silver can be found. Well, they, but if you hit the ore, you're likely to find silver. Did they ever find silver? They found uh, uh, one of the greatest silver mines uh, um, in uh, in in Leadville, and in fact, uh, in uh, um, all of the West, just by luck. And then, uh, good people that they were, they cut the um, paw in for his share. So he got a third. A Right? You know, it's he, third. He his third. So that sixty-five that's good for dollars groceries. was very well, very well spent. And then, um, sure enough, he decides that well, uh, you know, that I'm good at this, and I'm just going to put my shovel in wherever it will go. Bingo! Hits another one, uh, um, and that one's even bigger than the first. And then, uh, then. Now, um, hits another one. He, he hits the three biggest silver mines in the West. <laughs> and in the course of it, he turns from humble the, um, Haw Tabor, the Haw Tabor of the Opera House, Haw Tabor of, uh, he becomes the Lieutenant Governor. He then becomes a U.S. Senator. And most importantly for him, 
he becomes Haw Tabor of Mrs. Haw Tabor. Um, the, 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 who was um, the, the the bubbliest and most right. vivacious he, he, he lady? Dumps Augusta, right? Dumps like, Augusta, yeah. finds the babe, <laughs> and, and then, yeah. then uh, yeah, totally trophy has wife. a babe. Yeah, yeah. gets the trophy wife, and um, yeah, is an, is an, a United States senator, uh, um, having just been the most bumbling shop clerk uh, um, you could ever <laughs> encounter. That's lucky. And, and, and just following up on that, before I give Chris a, a, a chance to ask the last question, uh, he, he, he builds an opera house in Leadville, Colorado, which is still there. And here's a picture yes. of the restored opera house. I think he builds another one in uh, Denver. In Denver. Mm -hmm. And a fabulous statistic that you had in your book, if I read it correctly, uh, you never know, I can misread statistics, was that there was something in this era, 1880, 1890, there were 103 opera yeah. houses in yeah. Colorado. Yeah. Opera was really big then, a lot bigger than it. I don't think there's 103 opera houses in Colorado today. So, Yeah, it it's stunning. Big. I think it's a tribute to the fact that there was suddenly a lot of money in Colorado because yeah. of the mining interests. Uh, um, silver was big. Uh, um, the, the, um, it created a lot of these rather arbitrary silver fortunes. And then it became such a classy thing to do to build an opera house. Uh, and it was a way that a town could kind of distinguish itself. We have an opera house. And from uh, the other um, 102 towns with opera house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of, well, and then, you know, there's a rivalry between them. And then, uh, you know, Hall went on to build another one in Denver that even more glorious than this. And as I was mentioning before, that uh, he would have acts come in. Harry Houdini came in, but also Oscar Wilde came in. And, and Oscar Wilde was tremendously impressed with the cuisine. And the, he said, the cuisine, <laughs> yeah. For, uh, first course whiskey, second course whiskey. Third course whiskey. Now there's a cuisine we right up in Oscar Wilde's <laughs> alley. Yeah, talk about a happy hour. That that is one. Yeah. So, John, um, one of the things at the end, you, you kind of you know, obviously throughout the book, you talk about vast wealth, particularly for the 19th century, you know, numbers that people could only imagine. Sure. Um, and you make the connection with some of the the tycoons today, the Jeff Bezoses and, and whatnot. Um, yeah. So, kind of to bring the story forward. What what are some of those connections between those kingpins of of yore and and the ones today and and knowing what you know of those former yeah that's, uh, a, that's what, a great question yeah what what advice well, for, do you have for Jeff Bezos well for one thing I mean, the, the and Amazon Google these are called the platform firms of today uh, they're platform firms because they ride on a technology that they control and that they can then uh, um, control everything about it um, so that it, very much as the railroads it could do that they controlled um, you know by owning the tracks going through the west they ended up owning the towns they were in control of the goods they were they controlled the rates of the passengers and they, they, it was essentially monopolistic, and as is true for these uh, um, platform firms of today. The difference is that the platform firms of today can scale up to unimaginable heights that couldn't be reached by the, the railroads. I mean, these are global concerns that, that are able to handle every good that is conceivable. That you know, Amazon, for example, sells literally everything or almost literally everything so the scale is so much higher and that even as i mentioned in the book that the um the cornelius vanderbilt was the first tycoon it was the word that was created to fit his wealth of a hundred million dollars well that's a, this a an impressive fortune for the 1870 when he had it and it would be worth two billion dollars today uh, um bezos is worth a hundred, two, what is it? Two hundred billion dollars today. Uh, I mean, it, it's just, it, it's just staggering, staggering. Uh, um, the 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 wealth, and then of course with it comes political control. It was, was true of the railroads that they 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 the railroad interests would deal with the federal government as sovereign equals, they, and that the the they because they controlled so much of the wealth and had so much of the power. Same deal today. That, that is very hard. That Amazon, that you know, rides over national borders. It, it you know, it offshores its wealth. The um, it Bezos, as we learn, hasn't paid any federal taxes, uh, um, or at least did in some of these years. I mean, it's staggering, and it's staggering what they can get away with. And they can, because of the money that they control, uh, the uh, lobbyists that they can unleash, uh, uh, the 
politicians they can basically buy. The, um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a similar problem. And the other thing that I find about this, which is charming, and I'll just get into it briefly, but it seems to me that the, the culmination of the railroads, is it, these railroads, was to get to Los Angeles. And that what they were doing, all of these railroad men were chasing a dream their own dream of success and good, and good fortune. But they were also bringing the passengers along on a dream of their own. That there's something uniquely true about America. When you go west, you're chas chasing a better tomorrow, a fantasy of paradise. That paradise was time and again what promoters were offering these uh, potential passengers. If you go west on our railroad and you keep on going, you're going to find a better tomorrow at the end of it. Believe me, that's what they were offering. And ultimately, of course, they reach the sea. There's no farther that they can go. So what happens then? That's when Hollywood takes over. Hollywood has to be on the West Coast. It's at the end of this journey. It's where people, it's the repository of everybody's dreams uh, that have been collected from across the country and then put up on silver screens for everybody's uh, imagination to take flight of. And then on top of that, of course, the, so that you have the, the movie business, which is in a certain way the culmination of this whole Western migration, a sort of a, a migration of the imagination as much of, of physical movement. And then what else do you have? It's in California that these iPhones that everybody has in their pocket, that's where they come from. And that those iPhones combine the two things that we're talking about, the platform firms and the imagination of the West. And that, so that for me, that when I look at the image on my iPhone, what you're really seeing is the last little bit of that drive to get West for a better tomorrow and, and, and to live the fantasy Dream, that you turn, you, even your cell phone, you turn to it with hope and for escape. And that's the very thing that uh, the travelers in the 19th century were seeking. And, and it's still with us, but in John, a diminished and altered way. I, 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 I think you've got your next book there all ready to go. <laughs> and uh, so the sequel to the railroad book, John Sedgwick, we want to thank you so thank much you, for joining us uh, to talk about your book, From the River to the Sea about a fascinating railroad war and fascinating characters in the American West. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank oh, you. such a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Great. And cheers. Yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, we have to wrap up. We're going a little long today. But before we talk about next week's show, I do need to take a moment to mourn, mourn the passing of another Ghost Army veteran who died uh, on Friday. Um, sad to say that Bud Beer was uh, 97 years old uh, and died, um, as I say, Friday. He was in the 603rd Camouflage Engineers, which was the visual deception arm of the Ghost Army. And when I met him, he was in a wheelchair, but still full of personality and vigor. And the great picture on the left was taken by uh, the wonderful Boston Globe staff photographer, Pat Greenhouse. And the Globe did a story about Bud back in, in the Ghost Army back in 2015, and the reporter asked him about the effort that was just beginning then, six years ago, to award the unit a Congressional Gold Medal. And he said, as far as this medal business goes, I don't feel like any kind of hero. I feel like a very privileged person that I was there. And it was my privilege to know Bud, and I'm happy to have the honor to, uh, uh, the opportunity to honor his life and service today. So I want to make oh, mention of that. Yes. Yeah. It's hard to wake up in the morning and find a, a veteran's obituary in the email. And I, uh, I know you've gone through that as well. Uh, and next week, next week we have a story of a great British naval victory. Oh, fabulous. So next week we have a story from the American revolution <laughs> and it is despite the fact that it is a British victory. It is one of my favorite stories. It's also a stop on the upcoming Revolutionary War tour uh, from Isn't Stephen it? Ambrose historical oh, tours wow. that's Fine going years, it's going off uh, uh, this fall. Check that out, and we'll talk about that a little bit next week too. And uh, it's a naval battle on Lake Champlain, and the American naval forces are commanded by everybody's favorite plucky colonial hero. Who's that? One of my favorites. Benedict Arnold. Exactly. Yes, you didn't know. He, he turned out right. He turned out right in the end. Right? Another. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> no? Oh, we have different but, history books. I'm sorry. Yeah, apparently. But he is uh, in command of this, uh, of this uh, American naval force and, uh, at Valcor Island. And we're going to talk to Peter Kelly, who's the author of the new book, Valcor, the 1776 campaign that saved the cause of liberty. And we've had historians on this show who would already be in disagreement with that book based on the title. <laughs> and Eric Schnitzer, I'm thinking of you. Yeah. Um, and in a blatant act of marketing and promotion, we will also talk a little bit about the uh, Revolutionary War tour that we're doing. So that's right. what's up for next week. And everybody, you know, thank you so much for being with us. We so appreciate it. And uh, take care of yourselves. Stay safe, everybody. Stay safe, everybody.